we are going to be reading the story that explains Jesus' name to us. You can find it on page 965. It's Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to be beginning reading at verse 18. So that's uh, page 965 in those pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are, if you'd like to turn back to Matthew chapter 1, uh, the reading that we just uh, did, we're going to be looking at that now. So it's Matthew chapter 1. At page 965 in Church Bibles. And as we do that, uh, let's pray for God's help, shall we? O come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Father God, we pray that the same Spirit who formed the human body of Jesus in Mary's womb might form the image of Christ in us. We pray that you would be at work as we study your word together and hear it proclaimed. In Jesus' name, amen. The engagement photos turned out brilliantly. The dark-haired, beautiful young woman uh, nestled close in against the rough, ginger beard of her very attractive husband, I think. (laughs) Everyone was looking forward to the wedding of the year. At least that's how it felt to the family of Mary and Joseph. Except Joseph, as he smiled for the publicity photos in his hometown of Nazareth, knew that something was up. Matthew puts it quite delicately. Just look down at verse 18. He says that Mary was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. The implication is that Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. And Matthew says Joseph was a righteous man. Joseph knew he wasn't the father, because even though they were engaged, even though that was a a more intimate connection than being engaged is in our culture, they hadn't been sleeping together. And so Joseph knows that he's not the father, And because he's a righteous man, he he knows he's going to divorce her. But because he's a righteous man, he also knows that he wants to do that quietly. He wants to be as merciful as possible. And he seems to have made his mind up. But as it happens, that's the wrong thing to do in this situation. But there's no way for him to know that. And so an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream, we're told, and says to him, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
Well, our topic this morning is the origin, the birth of Jesus Christ. You can see we've got the heading there very clearly at the start of verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. Our our title today is The Fathers of Jesus. And really the punchline, I think, is that if this passage is right, Jesus doesn't have a human father. Now, before we get confused, we need to just be clear about something. When we say the creed, we confess that Jesus was begotten of his Father before all worlds. Jesus was eternally begotten as the divine Son. And that's not what we're talking about this morning. Our focus is on this very human, but also very miraculous, human birth of Jesus. We're talking about the next bit of the creed, the bit that goes for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Now the question is, is that just a bit of dogma? Is that something that we say because we have to, because it's traditional? Was Joseph's experience just a dream? We all know that dreams can be surprisingly uncannily accurate. I'm sure we've all experienced things that have happened in dreams and we thought, wow, that actually turned out to be true. And certainly throughout the history of humanity, people have always had a sense that dreams often kind of had a connection to the supernatural. But equally, always through human history, we've always had a sense, and this is certainly true in the Bible as well, that dreams are not always accurate, that that we can often be misled by dreams. So what about this dream? What about this dogma? Is it true? Is it reality? Well, the angel uh, tells Joseph two things. Uh, he says that, um, that, this, uh, that Mary is, con- is pregnant because of a unique birth. Uh, there's a unique origin. Verse 20, what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 21, he also, the angel also says to Joseph that this child is going to be unique. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. This morning, I want to look at those two aspects to what the angel says, this unique origin of Jesus and then the, the, the fact that he is a unique child. And what I want us to see, what I'm praying for, is that we would believe and embrace the virgin birth, not just as a bit of dogma, not just as a possible miracle story, but actually something central to our faith, something that will help us to understand more about who Jesus is and to receive him as our saviour. So firstly then, Jesus' unique origin. Now, we touched on the obvious objection to this last week. Uh, Drew pointed this out to us when we were looking at the mothers of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. People get pregnant all the time, and they quite often get pregnant in ways that they weren't intending to. And so it's not particularly surprising to find some people might want to come up with a story about that that maybe covers over the embarrassing situation. And maybe that's just what's going on here. It seems much easier, doesn't it, to believe that Mary just made the whole thing up or Joseph made the whole thing up than it does to believe that there was really a virgin who gave birth. But I want you to turn with me, if you could, to Matthew chapter 13. Uh, You find it on page 980 in the Pew Bibles. So I'm just going to lift this up because I keep jamming it. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 13, verse uh, 55 This, I think, is the worst thing that anyone says about Jesus' birth that we have on record. Uh, Jesus comes to his hometown of Nazareth, verse 54. Uh, He teaches in the synagogue. People are amazed, and they say, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary, and aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? Where, then, did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. The weird thing, the kind of offensive thing about Jesus' birth isn't that it's very miraculous. It isn't that it's immoral. It's that it's too ordinary to explain who Jesus is according to these folk. So you never get a sense in the Gospels that Jesus' birth, as you go on it through his life, is anything other than normal. Nobody attacks him for it. Nobody uh, questions that he really was Uh, born in a a kind of a normal way. And so the idea that this is just a cover-up by Christians to explain Jesus' sort of dodgy ancestry just doesn't really fit 
with the historical facts. There's no sense that Christians were embarrassed about Jesus' virgin birth. And we're trying to explain it. In fact, it's more the other way around. We have only know about this, and we only have any questions about the virgin birth, because at some point, Mary and Joseph decided to go public, and the, the first Christians loved it. They made it front and center of what they told everyone about Jesus. The second century writer, Origen, who was writing about 90 years after the death of the apostles, said that everyone knows in the, in the, in the kind of ancient world about four things about Christianity. And one of them is this unique origin. Everybody knows about the virgin birth. Christians are not embarrassed that Christ was born of a virgin. And I think we can see one of the reasons why we're not embarrassed about it uh, in verse 22. Matthew explains that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The prophet that he's talking about there is the prophet Isaiah, who was writing about 700 years before this. And unfortunately, we don't have time this morning to go and look at the details of that prophecy in Isaiah. But even from what we've got here in Matthew, we can see so many parallels between what Isaiah had spoken about and what was fulfilled in Jesus. So just trace them with me. Uh, Verse 23. The virgin will be with child, Isaiah said. Now, you might be aware that some people will go back to Isaiah and notice that the word for virgin uh, here isn't necessarily talking about a virgin uh, in in Isaiah's prophecy. Uh, It could just be a young woman, a kind of woman of kind of marriageable age. Now, commentators are divided on this. Some people think, yes, Isaiah was actually really talking about a virgin. Other people think, no, he was talking about a young woman. I actually think there's good evidence to think that he was wanting to say this is going to be an unusual birth for a woman that you don't expect to get pregnant. But either way, it doesn't really matter. The point is, Isaiah said there's going to be this young woman giving birth. And when we come to Jesus, we find that that's been fulfilled in an extraordinary way, in an astonishing way, in a way that you couldn't predict. It's been almost super fulfilled. Not just a young woman, but a virgin gave birth or conceives. The virgin is with child. And then we go on in the prophecy, uh, she will give birth to a son. And just to see how how clear Matthew is that this prophecy is so uh, completely fulfilled, just have a look at verse 25. Uh, Joseph does take uh, Mary home as his wife, as the angel says. But, Matthew says, he had no union with her, and he means sexual union, until she gave birth to a son. So you can see what Matthew's trying to point out. Mary was still a virgin, even though she'd got married now when she, by the time she gave birth. The virgin will give birth to a son. And then uh, the prophecy says, and they will call him Emmanuel. And we get that several times in this passage. Verse 21, you are to give him the name, or you are to call him the name Jesus. And then uh, verse 25, and he called him or gave him the name Jesus. One final thing before we move on. This uh, prophecy hasn't just been ripped out of its context. If you go back and look at this prophecy originally, it was given to a fearful member of the house of David. One of the kings of Israel descended from David was scared. And just look at how the angel addresses Joseph in this dream. Verse 20. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. So we can see in this prophecy an amazingly accurate and astonishing fulfillment, almost a super fulfillment of this Old Testament prophecy written 700 years before. And so brothers and sisters, let's not be embarrassed about the virgin birth. Isn't it wonderful to see how completely this prophecy was kept even beyond what we could sort of ordinarily expect through the birth of Jesus. Early Christians wanted to proclaim the virgin birth from the rooftops because it gives us a much deeper, much greater sense of who Jesus is. Now, we don't have time this morning to get much more into the nitty-gritty of some of the different um, historical facts and different sort of debates. So I want to recommend a book to you if you want to look at this a bit further. If we could have it up on the screens... Uh, It's an old book um, by a guy called Gresham Machen. 
and you can see how to spell that up there on the screen. It's called The Virgin Birth of Christ. It is incredibly detailed, very thorough. He just goes through everything, all the historical stuff, all the kind of gospel evidence, and, and really works it all out. Very helpful. It's also free, which is great. It, you can get a PDF of it on the internet for free because it's, it's so old, but it's still, I think, unsurpassed. So uh, if you're interested in some of the historical facts, uh, do take a note of that um, and take a look at that over Christmas. Uh, what I want to do just now, just before we move on, is try to show us something from Matthew uh, that will help us to understand the, the significance and why the virgin birth is so, so helpful for us to believe in and to proclaim. Uh, and this is that Matthew, when he tells us about Jesus' birth, he's really contrasting Jesus with everyone else in Jesus' family tree. So just flick back to chapter 1, uh, verse 15 and 16, uh, just back over the page. Now, we don't have to read the whole genealogy to get a, a taste of this pretty quickly, I think. So let's, let's, let's just go to the end of the genealogy, verse 15. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Matan. Matan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Do you see the pattern? Every... Every person in Jesus' family tree, apart from Jesus, has a father who precedes him. Father begets son, who begets son, who begets son, who begets son, and so on for many, many, many generations. And the thing is, we know from elsewhere in the Bible that each of those people who was born into the world, father and son, father and son, father and son, each of those was born in sin. Each of those comes into the world bearing the stain of sin, our pollution of our turning away from God, our corruption and our tendency towards evil. Each of us comes into the world bearing sin. And so all of our acts, everything we do, is tainted by this stain of sin that kind of runs through the family tree. And even the thing that meant that we are here today, the act that produced us, even that was sinful. Now, sex in itself isn't sinful, but... Everything we do is sinful. So we can't, none of us can say that we're here even on this planet apart from sin having some impact on us. Amazing when you think about it, isn't it? But David said, King David said, in sin, my mother conceived me. And so it is for all of us, except for one person. Because he wasn't born of any human decision at all. Not of a husband's will, not of any natural descent. Jesus was born by the direct working of the Holy Spirit in Mary's womb. The Holy Spirit took an egg and gave it life in Mary's womb. He sanctified it. He made it grow. He protected it from the stain of sin. We don't know any more details than that, I don't think. It's a miracle. But this is what we confess. And this is why the virgin birth is such good news. Because there was one who came into our world apart from sin, who was utterly pure, holy through the Holy Spirit, right from his conception. And in that sense, he's a bit like Adam. Adam was, if you like, made by God's power directly from, you could say, virgin ground, couldn't you? And in the same way, Jesus was born directly of God's power on virgin ground. He's a new beginning. He's a new way to be human. He's a new start for all of us. It's because he is pure that there is hope for any of us who carry around that stain of sin. So let's not be embarrassed about the virgin birth. Let's believe it and confess it, that Christ was born of a virgin. So unique origin. Uh, let's move on uh, secondly to uh, the, the sense that uh, the angel gives us that Jesus is going to be a unique child. Let's remind ourselves of verse 21. The virgin, the angel says, will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now, some of you, I'm sure, uh, as we were looking through some of those specific fulfillments of the prophecies that we just worked through, will have been thinking to yourselves, well, hang on. Matthew's so excited about showing that everything lines up, but then the name is different, which is kind of, you think, almost that's the most important thing. 
So uh, the prophecy says that the virgin will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. So what's going on there? Why does it become Jesus? Well, Matthew gives us a bit of a clue when he translates the word, this name Emmanuel. He says, verse 23, it means God with us. So I think the meaning of the, the name is more important than the actual name itself. Matthew's saying this child is going to have the reputation, that sort of sense of name, of being God with us. What an amazing thing to have that reputation of people saying, yes, God was truly with us in this man. Now, it's not new that God would want to be with his people in the Bible. All through the Old Testament, that's one of the great promises that God makes, that he will be with his people. You can think of the burning bush in the Exodus. God comes down, doesn't he, to save his people. And he carries them through. He leads them by a, by a, 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 a smoke, the cloud and the, and the smoking pillar through the wilderness. And yet, that sense of God being with his people to save them in the Old Testament was always also quite a scary thing because God was with his people and so their sin suddenly took on massive proportions. And so they found themselves being judged whenever they turned away from God. Think of the golden calf. Think of many other incidents in the wilderness. God is with his people to save, but that brings with it judgment too. And so is this good news? Is this good news for us this Christmas that we read about a child who is God with us? I wonder, are we ready for God to be with us? We had to think about a villain uh, this year. I think we could all come up with probably one shared name. Let's have him up on the screen. This man's exploits have become very well known and thankfully so. Isn't it good to have the truth coming into the light, and for people to see him for what he is. And if you've been following the news or social media, you've probably seen that the revelations about what Harvey Weinstein did to lots of beautiful Hollywood actresses has actually spawned a whole movement of people uh, saying, me too. They've kind of put a hashtag up on social media and said, me too, I've been abused by normally men in positions of power. But the reality is, what that Me Too movement has shown is really shown that the kind of thing that Harvey Weinstein did isn't really that unique in our society, is it? It's kind of much more common than we'd like to think. And really, if we're honest, I think all of us would probably have to say that there are people around us who might want to go on social media and say, Me Too, if they felt able to. I know there certainly are people who would want to do that about me. Maybe in the sexual arena, maybe in other arenas. People that we've wanted to use for our own desires, who we've used to get our way. People who we've had power over and have forced them to do what we want. The truth is, all of us are a bit like Harvey Weinstein. All of us have got the heart of that man. Thanks, we'll take him down. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? Are we ready for God to be with us? Well, come back with me. Uh, Let's, well, first of all, we'll just see that there really is plenty of judgment in the gospel story. Just look across the page to chapter 3, verse 12. Matthew tells us that when Jesus comes, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus comes to clear out the stables. Are we ready to meet him? Well, let's come back to verse uh, 21 and these wonderful words that the angel gives. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I don't think Jesus needed to become human in order to judge us. I think God could have quite comfortably judged us for our sin without becoming human. And so the angel reminds us that the primary main purpose that God became man was in order to save us 
Jesus is God with us to save us. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven and was incarnate as the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. Christmas is good news. This unique birth of a unique child tells us that God has come near to us in order to save us. To a race of Harvey Weinsteins, the messenger of the Lord says to us, don't be afraid. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel. There is somebody pure enough to take our sin. There is a new kind of way of being a human in the world. God has come to us. He is our Emmanuel. I wonder, will you believe him? Will you take him? Will you embrace him to be your Emmanuel this Christmas? Will you take him as your saviour? the one who came to take away the stain of sin, to purify us, and to bring us to God. Will you do that? Will you celebrate the birth of Emmanuel? Well, we will, won't we? And we will praise him with the Father and with the Son for all eternity, because God is with us. Amen. Let's pray, uh, shall we? Our Father, we praise you for this great miracle that the Virgin conceived and bore a son. And we praise, him that, we praise you that his name was Jesus. We praise you that he came to save us from our sin and to be with us as God. Lord, thank you for coming near to us this Christmas. Thank you for being with us, even to the very end of the age. Lord, we pray that we would come near to you. Wash away our sin. Renew us in righteousness. Give us eternal life, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. We've got an opportunity now to confess our faith in the virgin birth and all those other wonderful things about the gospel. We're going to stand uh, if you want to confess uh, the... So 720, if you can get to seeing one of these, do, if you can't, that's fine, Uh, We Believe by Graham Kendrick, Uh, so we'll just say this, Um, so if you can get to seeing this, number 720 in the mission phrase there, uh, let's say this slowly together, we believe in God the Father maker of the universe, and in Christ, his Son, our Saviour, come to us by virgin birth. We believe he died to save us, bore our sins, was crucified. Then from death he rose victorious, ascended to the Father's side. We believe he sends the Spirit on his church with gifts of power, God, his word of truth affirming, sends us to the nations now. He will come again in glory, judge the living and the dead, and every knee shall bow before him. Then must every tongue confess. Amen. Shall we pray? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the huge number of blessings we so easily take for granted. Health and strength, family and friends, a home and shelter, a health service and education, a church and Christian fellowship. As you have granted us so much, food in abundance, money to buy gifts, warmth and clothes to wear, So we pray for people in fragile contexts, not least as we've just been viewing in the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
where in the last 18 years, 6 million people have died through civil conflict. Thank you for the privilege we have to be able to partner with Tear Fund and Christian Aid, committed to break the cycle of violence, despair and fear. And we pray for the work in the DRC, enabling people, most especially children and women, to find hope and courage within contexts of violence and pain. And we pray too for the work in Zimbabwe, supporting some of the poorest people and building a future and granting hope. This Christmas time, gracious Lord, as we enjoy so much, and thank you for the gift of your incarnate Son, the lovely Lord Jesus. Out of hearts of gratitude, enable us to be kind, to be generous, to be compassionate towards the people we meet and sensitive towards their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Father God, to that end, we also pray for the work of our partners in Gilgal, in Rwanda, in Sapporo, in Japan, in Moldova, in Nepal, in Niger, through Spud Bear Ministries. And as we anticipate Christianity explored in January, may the presence of Christ Jesus be evident, preceding it and real at it. And finally, we pray for those who weigh heavily upon our hearts, those who are fragile or frail, in hospital or at home, people experiencing treatment or sad at this time through bereavement, unemployment or loss. And we pray that by the enabling of the Holy Spirit, the special comfort of your people and your divine presence may give joy and delight and eternal hope. And all these we are prayers we ask in the name of Emmanuel, Christ with us, our Savior, Jesus. Amen.